Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Janneke Schwaner, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California in Irvine. I'm happy to welcome you to another in a series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. These workshops have been supported by the National Science Foundation Division of Integrative Organismal Systems with the goal of bringing together scientists at the intersection of organismal biology and physics. We aim to highlight the use of model-based and mathematical tools to address fundamental questions in organismal biology. We hope that these workshops will generate dialogue and collaborations to help both experimental and theoretical scientists make effective use of mathematical and modeling tools for understanding animal movement and behavior. The workshops will be recorded and shared as an online resource hosted through the UCI Center for Integrative Movement Sciences with the School of Biological Scientists. And with that, please welcome the rest of today's workshop speakers, Taylor Dick from the University of Queensland, Kisa Nishikawa from Northern Arizona University, and Surabi Simha from Emory University. So today's workshop is part two of two in multi-scale muscle modeling. And today we aim to showcase a series of modeling approaches to predict time-varying muscle forces during a variety of movement tasks. We will guide the audience through hands-on examples for a cross-bridge model, titan clutch model, and a hill-type model. Additionally, we hope to stimulate valuable discussion regarding the potential and pitfalls of these approaches. We envision this workshop may also facilitate sharing of data sets, models, and simulation tools with our scientific community. We'll introduce ourselves briefly before we get started, and I'll go first. So as said, my name is Janneke. I'm a second year postdoc in Monica Daly's neuromechanics lab at the University of California in Irvine, where I study locomotor mechanics, sensory control, and in vivo and in situ muscle tendon dynamics in guinea fowl. Additionally, I'm also interested in other unsteady locomotor modes like jumping, and I'm interested in tails and how these assist in predator prey outcomes for which I use the kangaroo rat as a model species. I will now pass on the mic to Taylor. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Dick. I'm an academic at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. So I did my PhD in Canada and postdoc in the US before starting my lab here in um, Australia about four years ago. And, and broadly speaking, my group is interested in understanding the neuromuscular and biomechanical mechanisms that, that underpin healthy and pathological movement. So more specifically, we're interested in the discovery science things. So for understanding that the fundamental mechanisms of how muscles and tendons function using a combination of an in vivo and in, in silico approaches. So this will be the focus of, of our second part of our um, workshop series. And my lab's also interested in how muscle tendon properties and motor function adapt to external challenges that may arise due to size, age, and disease, not just in humans, but um, I'm particularly interested in scaling across different, different species. And finally, we're interested in investigating how wearable devices interact with biological tissues to augment, to perturb, or to restore movements. We collaborate a lot with, with engineers um, to do this. Over to you, Kisa. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back if you're rejoining us from workshop number one. Um, my name is Kisa Nishikawa, and I'm a professor at Northern Arizona University. And um, my research interests include um, understanding muscle mechanics from molecules to movement. And I've been lately working intensively on trying to understand the role of Titan in muscle as a tunable spring. And um, most recently, I've been working on improving predictive models of in vivo muscle force. So I'll be talking about different models and showing you some codes um, uh, and some example in vivo data. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow with Lena Teng at Emory University right now. And it was, uh, right now I'm working on using cross bridge models to understand muscle behavior and also use the model to predict muscle spindle firing. And eventually I hope to use these models to uh, understand motor control and motor learning, which is what I did uh, during my PhD. And yeah, that's about me, thank you. 
So thank you, team, for these introductions. Um, I will walk you all quickly through the workshop outline before we get started. So first, Surabi will walk us through crossbridge models, after which Kisa uh, will do a walk through the Titan Klutz and hill type models with a focus on animal uh, models. And lastly, Taylor will show us a GUI and talk, us, uh, talk to us about hill type muscle models um, with a focus on, on humans. Um, as a fourth aspect of this workshop, we'll take questions and hope to engage in a discussion with the audience. So please write down any questions you might have and keep them till the end of the session, uh, and we will go over them all. And with that, I will pass it on to Sarabi. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you, Yannicka. Okay, so I'm going to begin my talk with some learning objectives for today. Uh, I'm hoping to get through a very brief recap of how the Crossbridge model is used to predict muscle force for those of you who uh, missed on the previous talk. And then I'll uh, spend most of my time trying to go over how we as a user can use this Crossbridge model to simulate a trial based on the types of protocols we want to use. Then I'll also have some examples where I will talk about how different rate functions affect the force prediction from this model. So for steps two and three, I'll mostly use a muscle stretch to go over the uh, behavior. But in step four, I'll go over some other protocols such as muscle shortening, and I'll also talk about how we can uh, feed a experimental data to the Crossbridge model. And finally, if we have time, I'll try to talk about some of the pros and cons of the Crossbridge model. Okay, so with that, uh, here's a very brief recap. Um, I, I'm interested in using the Crossbridge model to predict force, energy, and sensory signals, all of which are outputs from a muscle. But I'm going to spend the stock focusing on how a Crossbridge model predicts muscle force. So to understand that, here's a schematic of a Crossbridge model. On the right, you can see uh, at the top an actin thin filament, and at the bottom you see the myosin thick filament. And essentially, uh, the myosin heads can attach to certain binding sites on the actin filament, creating a cross bridge, which generate force, which we then scale up to the overall muscle active force. Now, in a cross bridge model, we uh, simulate this cross bridge as a spring that can exist in one of that can exist in one of two states. So it can be detached as shown on the left here, or it can be attached as shown in the right schematic. And the cross bridge is continuously cycling between these attached and detached states, and this transition is governed by rate functions given by F and G. And of course, it's only the attached state that can generate force, and the force generated is estimated as spring force, which is the product of cross bridge stiffness and the change in cross bridge length. So the cross bridge length is change in cross bridge length is denoted as delta x, which is the difference in the resting length of the spring and the length of the spring at, give at any given time point, which is shown as x i here. And once we know the force from a single cross bridge, we can get the total muscle force as the sum of all the cross bridge forces, and we can also add any passive elements that we have in the model. Now, this is the overall Crossbridge model, which is a part of the MAT Myosim application, which is a MATLAB uh, software. And all of this is hosted in the GitHub uh, server, which is linked in the top link over here. Okay, so that was the Crossbridge model, but I'm going to spend the rest of this uh, talk going over how we can use the Crossbridge model to simulate different trials. So I've broken this up into three steps. The first step is where we generate a protocol. Then we select the rate functions, because this affects a large portion of how what kind of force is predicted. And the last step is simulating each time point. But uh, this is really contained within the part of the math myosim that, as a user, we don't really need to spend a lot of time on. So I will leave this part out for today's uh, tutorial. OK, so going into the first step, which is to generate a protocol. So at the top is really just a screenshot from the MATLAB code. And at the uh, bottom left is what the protocol that it generates. So first, we input the trial duration in seconds. Then we have a, a time when the activation begins. So throughout this tutorial, I'm going to just use a simple example where the activation is constant, which means that we just have to input when the activation begins. 
and then we also have to input the amount of activation. So you'll notice that the activation is given as PCA in, in units of PCA, which is how muscle calcium concentration is measured in solution. Now in the time series of activation, you'll see this is a log PCA, which is also just a concentration of calcium. Now, the reason we have to do this is because the cross bridge model takes in calcium, and using that, it determines the number of actins that are available, which is what actin sites need to be available for the myosin heads to bind to them. Now, for those of you who are not used to thinking of activation as calcium concentration, we can use an activation curve like this to quickly uh, convert between a PCA and activation, a percentage activation. Okay, so. Uh, once we have the activation, the next line of code is to specify the time when the stretch begins. Once again, uh, I'm going to the first half of the tutorial at least is going to be focused on an example of muscle stretch. So for that, the code involves mentioning the beginning of the stretch and then also the total length of the stretch. Now you'll notice that the length of the stretch is in nanometers. So because for this tutorial, I've basically simplified the muscle into a sarcomere. And what you're seeing is that the sarcomere is going to be stretched by 37 nanometers. Also for this tutorial, I've simplified the model further and assumed that the only thing that stretches is the cross bridge. This is not essential, but I'm using these simplifi simplifications for the tutorial. So if you assume that it's only the cross bridge that stretches, that means that the stretch in the sarcomere is directly applied to the cross bridge. But this does not mean that the entire cross bridge stretches by 37 nanometer, because if you recall, our simulation is a series of time steps. So if you look at the delta L of t that I'm pointing at, this is the change in length for a single time step. And it is this that gets applied to the uh, cross bridges. This is because after a single time step, the cross bridges can change their state, which means that they can change their length as well. Okay, so that's the protocol. But like I said, the cross bridges can change their state after each time step, and how they change their step is governed by the rate functions. So the next part of this uh, simulating a trial is selecting the rate functions. Now this schematic shows the cross bridge cycling between attachment and detachment based on rate functions f and g. Now here is the code to, uh, that, uh, where you input the rate functions. As you can see, I've uh, included all the equations in just this model file. But what this model file contains are just these equations. So f is your attachment rate equation, and g is your detachment rate equation. Now, we don't need to go into understanding the exact form of this equation, but you'll notice that the equation does consist other values such as kcb and kboltzmann and temperature. And these are all values that we need, which are contained in the base model. So that's why the first line of code calls a base model that just has some of these values. And to the base model, I write the rate, uh, rate functions that we want to use. Okay, so now on the left side, you can visualize what these F and G rate functions look like. So in the top row, you see the F attachment rate, and in the bottom row, you see the G, D detachment rate, and both of these are a function of delta X, which is your X axis. And below the X axis is a schematic of the cross bridge. So at positive delta X's, the cross bridge is being stretched, and at negative delta x's, the cross bridge is being shortened. And the way to read this function is that, say, a lot of cross bridges are at a delta x of minus 4. And if these cross bridges are in a detached straight state, that means that they will attach at a rate of, say, 4 per second. <laughs> and if they are in the same, at the same delta x, but they're already in an attached state, then they will detach at a rate given by this detachment rate function. Okay, so that was uh, how we simulate, uh, simulate a trial. Now I'm going to go into MATLAB and try and run the same code for you. So, so all of this code is in MATLAB, like I said. And I'm going to start running it. It should be quick, but I'll start running it just to make sure we get through. So the first part is generating the protocol. This is the same uh, code that I showed you on the slide. And then I save the mod, a protocol that we created into a file, which is what's happening over here. And then the second section is where we select the rate function. Once again, I, this was what, what was on the slide. But then uh, once I uh, select the rate functions, I save the rate function into a file. And the last step is simulating each point. So this is actually happening from line 54 over here. 
and all uh, the simulation really t uh, is me calling the simulation driver function, which is part of the MathMySM software. And you can see uh, to the simulation driver, I pass the protocol file, I pass it the model file, which contains the rate functions, and then I pass it this options file, which is really just telling it what kind of display I would like. And then I pass it a results file where it can store the results once they are generated. So that's how you simulate. And then below that, I just have some code to visualize things. And since it did run, I am going to just show you the plots. Okay, so on the left side are the rate functions, similar to what you saw on the slide. And on the right side in the bottom two rows are the activation and the length, which are the inputs. And at the top, we have the corresponding force that the simulation outputs. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and continue with the presentation. Oh yeah, so um, I have the same figures now on the presentation, but now I've boxed them up into three boxes. So the rate functions are in the parameters box, the length and activation time series are in the input box, and we have the total force in the output box. And you'll notice that the force is units of Newton per meter squared, but that's because the simulation outputs force um, per unit uh, area of the sarcomere. So I'm going to use this to anchor us uh, throughout the rest of the tutorial. So first, uh, I'm going to use the same example, but try and explain the effect of rate function, the force output. So now you'll see that I've included another box at the bottom. This is also an output. And here I'm going to fill up how the fraction of attached cross bridges change over time. So the first time step I'm going to pick is 0.4 seconds. So if you look at the input box, you can see that the activation is constant, the length is constant, and we have a steady state force output at that point. Now to understand what's happening, let's go look at the parameters box. So in the parameter, you'll see that the F attachment rate is highest at a delta X of zero and the detachment rate is very low at delta x of zero. What this means is that when the muscle is activated, most of the cross bridges, uh, they're most likely to attach at a delta x zero. And that is what you see in the bottom row, that most of the cross bridges are attached at a delta x of zero. Okay, so the next time step we pick, if we go back to the input box, is 0.56 seconds, and here the stretch has begun, so the muscle is being stretched right now. And to understand again, let's go to the parameters box. So if the muscle is being stretched, the cross bridges are being stretched, which means they're being moved to its positive delta x. And you'll notice that at low positive delta x, the attachment rate starts decreasing. The detachment rate is still really low or has barely changed from delta x of zero. What this means is that the cross bridges are still holding on, but they're being stretched. So if you look at the bottom uh, distribution plot again, you can see this here, where the cross bridges have now moved to a positive delta x. And if you recall what I said earlier, the force from a cross bridge is proportional to delta x. So what this means is that we get a large force. And that is reflected in the force output at the top, in the, um, second, uh, in the second purple line. And this is actually one of the features of the transient force response. Now the, second, uh, the third time point I'll pick is 0.7 seconds. And you'll notice that this is the time point immediately after the end of stretch, so the length is no longer ch changing. And if back to the parameters box, uh, you'll see that at very long delta, positive delta x's, the attachment rate becomes of almost zero, but the detachment rate starts sharply increasing. So as the stretch goes on, the cross bridges get pulled further and further to further and further positive delta x's, and when they get there, they chemically detach because of the high detachment rate. And once they have detached, they are most likely, likely to reattach at a delta x of zero. And that is what you see in the cross bridge population in the third figure here. You see that the cross bridge population is now back towards zero, which means that we get a slightly lower force. And that's reflected in the force output at the top with the slightly lower force. And the last time step I pick is 1.39 seconds, where basically the uh, length is constant and the force has reached steady state. And this is also reflected in the cross bridge population returning to be centered over a delta x of zero. Okay, so the main takeaway here is that the rate functions have a huge effect on how uh, the way the force is produced in a cross bridge model. So given that, how do we go about choosing a rate function? So one way to do it is to hypothesize 
their shape based on muscle behavior. So here is a classic example of that. This is a rate function chosen by Huxley. But the main reason for this choice was really that this function uh, allows the muscle to produce positive work uh, when it's activated. And we knew muscles do that at that time. And so another way to choose rate functions is to use, uh, is to actually measure them from experiments. And what this means, if you think about it, is that we want to hold the uh, actin and myosin in very close proximity, and then we want to observe how quickly they attach and detach. Now, the, here at the top is a schematic bit of such an experiment, and at the bottom is uh, one experimental results where they've tried to estimate the detachment rate. But really, these are really difficult experiments, and not a lot of people do them, which means that we don't have a, a comprehensive data set that we can use to uh, estimate rate functions in all the cases that we care about. So what we really do is that we hypothesize what the rate functions to look like, but we try to constrain ourselves within what we do know about what is physiologically feasible. Okay, now that we know that, I'm going to walk you through two different types of rate functions and what will happen. I'm once again going to anchor us in the stretch example that I just walked you through. But on top of this, I'm going to overlay what happens if we use, say, a Huxley type of rate function. So this is in pink. So if we go back to the input box again, we see that the input has not changed at all. But if we go to the parameters box, now we have these pink lines, which look quite different from the black curves. And to explain it, I'm just going to use two time points. So I'm going to use the first time point, which is at steady state. And here you'll see that the pink curves, the cross bridges are shifted to positive delta x already. This is because if you look at the parameter box, the attachment rate is pretty high at a positive delta x, and detachment rate is low at that point, which means that when the muscle is activated, the cross bridges are most likely to attach at this delta x. The other time point I'm going to use is 0.56 seconds, which is during stretch. So just like I said before, during stretch, the muscle gets stretched, which means the cross bridges get stretched. But because in these rate functions, the cross bridges already started at a positive delta x, this means that they get stretched further, which increases the force, but then we also lose a bunch of cross bridges once they hit the limit. So the force does not increase as much. And that is reflected uh, in the output force response in the top box, where if you look at the pink line at 0.56 seconds, it increases, but the increase is not as much as the increase you get with the black line. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the other two time points, but the behavior uh, follows the same logic. Instead, I'm going to show you another rate function in blue now in the parameter box. Now, this is a rate function uh, that is a little bit more informed by the experimental data, which is what I showed you in the previous slide. So you can see that the detachment curve now reduces, uh, keeps uh, decreasing, and then goes up sharply at positive delta x. Now, uh, these are uh, the the attachment and detachment curves are quite different, and that is reflected in the cross bridge population at the bottom. You can see that the blue line is, the blue curve is quite different from the pink and the black. <clears throat> but um, an interesting point maybe is that if you look at the top output box, you can now see that the blue and black are quite similar, especially in steady state. But they are still quite different at the transient force response. So and maybe an interesting takeaway is that uh, the way we choose rate functions um, might also be dependent on what aspect of the force we want to predict and how well we want to predict it. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so that was all about rate functions. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and now talk about different protocols. So I'm going to once again anchor us first in the stretch example that I've been going over, but this time I'm gonna keep the rate functions constant. So the parameters box on the left is going to stay the same but instead I'm going to change the muscle length. So if you look at the input box on the right, you see there is now this black dotted line. So activation is constant, but in the length you have the black dotted line and the length is uh, shortening, so it's decreasing length. And if you look at the bottom cross bridge distribution, you can now see that the uh, black dotted line uh, moves to the left, which, is, which means that the cross bridges are shortening. So just remember that Cross, uh, the rate functions are the same, so the difference between the dashed line and the solid line is that change in length. And maybe an interesting figure to focus on is the very last time point, the cross bridge distribution. You'll notice that the 
uh, both the dashed line and the solid line are now centered over zero because this is at steady state, but you'll see that the dashed line has a higher amplitude and this is because they're at different lengths. And another interesting point to note is uh, the force output. Can you can see in this output that both uh, the stretch and the shortening uh, have a significant transient force response. Uh, and this is because of the cross bridge dynamics, essentially. OK, so just one more example of how we can use the cross bridge model. We can use it to simulate experimental data. Now in the input box you see here, we once again have activation in the bottom row and length change in the top row. But what I'm showing you now are inputs that were used to actually a rat soleus muscle fiber in an experiment. And in the bottom row, uh, the activation is say, showing you that that muscle was uh, fully activated, just like in my other uh, previous slides. But what we can do with the cross bridge model is we can take the same input and we can feed it to our model. So I'm going to use the same original rate function. And if we combine the two on the right hand side, you can see the force output that our cross bridge model predicts. But now, because we also have experimental data of of what the force should look like, we can compare the force with the uh, we can compare the experimental force with the model output, and we can create cost functions based on how well we want the force to match and what parts we want to match. And I think this is something Kisa is going to talk more about. And we can using these cost functions, we can optimize a rate function to get a very good fit or how good of however good fit, good fit we want. And I say we optimize rate functions, but uh, if you recall, this is what our rate functions look like. So actually our rate function in this case has three parameters. So really what we're doing is we're optimizing these three parameters to get a good fit between the model and experimental data. And again, like I said, uh, theoretically, we can change this rate function to have as many parameters as we want, but we would like to ground ourselves in physiology. And so we'd like to use metrics like of information criteria to make sure we're not adding parameters that we don't need. Okay, so those are all the examples I have. Just quickly, um, pros and cons list, maybe for discussion. Uh, just want to say everything on the pros list are things we care about and the cross bridge model can do. Um, on the cons list, like I said, we cannot uh, validate the uh, all of the parameters. Uh, and a uh, cross bridge model is computationally pretty intensive, which is something some of you brought up during the talk two weeks ago. And this is, as, this is especially true as we scale up the model and try to use it in feedback control and things like that. But this is also an active area of research that we would like to improve upon and hopefully improvements in computational technology also will help with. Okay, uh, and with that, uh, just a Acknowledgements to all the people who've actually done the work behind me, what I just showed. So, um, thank you. I can stop sharing. I'm up next. Thanks, Sarabi. That was really interesting. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about hill type and Titan inspired models and try and go through looking at code, but I wasn't so ambitious as Sarabi to actually try and run the code during the session. So you'll have to bear with me. So I wanna talk a little bit more detail about hill models and go over um, not just the parameters, which will be a little bit of a review from last time, but also the algorithms and code and uh, that go along with them. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit, take a little deviation and talk about um, how we optimize parameters um, and talk about cost functions as Sarabi was just mentioning and what types of criteria we use for goodness of fit and also a little bit more theoretically about local versus global optimization. And then I'll talk, uh, switch gears and go back to the Titan clutch models, review the parameters and, and, and discuss the algorithms and code. But the optimization methods are the, pretty much the same regardless of the model that you use. So, um, so when we actually look at the force predictions made by the models, they'll be employing very similar code for the optimizations. Um, this will be a chance to review and extend some of the assumptions and limitations and the really different underlying philosophies underlying the, the models. And then I wanna just um, 
uh, talk a little bit, zoom out to like 40,000 feet and, uh, and explain why I think we need really to be investing more time in improving these muscle models. Um, and finally, my last slide will show where you can find example codes and data. And I'd be delighted to help anybody play around with the codes who'd like to. And as with Sarabis, all of my codes are also in that lab. So um, actually, why am I slide advance? Okay, great. Okay, so, um, so reviewing from last time, you know, Hill models have basically two modules, which is the activation dynamics module, in which an input stimulus is converted into a force and a muscle mechanics model, in which the um, uh, force length and force velocity relationships are um, uh, used to modify the force due to activation. And so reviewing from last time, typical Hill models have a total of, um, I can't even read my own slide at the top, but I think it's like 17 or 18 total parameters, eight of which are free. Um, and um, the other ones are measured by experiment. And, and one difference from the Crossbridge models is it's relatively easy to measure um, the active and passive force length relationships and the isotonic force velocity relationship. And this has been done in hundreds of experiments in dozens of different kinds of muscles. Um, but the activation dynamics part, especially, so the, our example is gonna be a hill type model with third order activation dynamics. And I partly chose this one um, because it has more parameters that need to be optimized, but also because it's very modular. So if you have the code for the third order activation dynamics, you can comment out the, a lot of the code and run it as a first order action activation dynamics problem as well. So you can play around by just commenting out some of the code with making it a first or a second or a third order model. So in the activation dynamics, we typically have eight uh, parameters, most of which may be free um, when we're working with um, in vivo data. Um, and oops, sorry. Um, I don't want to go through the list of all of them here. We talked about them last time, but you'll see them appear in the code. Um, so there's um, eight parameters in the um, activation dynamics and um, seven, I guess it was seven or eight parameters in the muscle mechanics if you include the pination angle. Um, so the, al the basic algorithm of hill type muscle models, and I think that um, uh, uh, um, Taylor's also gonna talk about this a little bit, is first we define the model parameters, then we define the input variables. And for the examples that I'm gonna show you, those are time, activation, which is typically a filtered EMG, but can also be electrical stimuli, depending on the experiments that you're modeling. The muscle length changes over time. And um, for these simulations, I also input the velocity separately because um, taking the derivative of the length to get the velocity produced a lot of error in the force predictions. So then the model calculates the first, second, and third order activation in each time step. And I'll walk you, and this, um, the equations are from Sabrina Lee's paper that was published in 2013. I'll walk you through that code in a minute. And then um, the models that I'm gonna show you have a relatively simplified muscle mechanics with no tendon parameters. And those are from a recent paper from James Wakeling's lab on our rats. And so in the muscle mechanics, we have the passive and active force components and the force velocity relationship. And finally, the model calculates the muscle force at each time step using this overall governing equation. And it turns out that the time required to run the simulations can, depends a lot on the order of the activation. So you can run the code in an hour or less if you have first order activation, but because you're taking the second and third derivatives of the activation input in each time step, that really requires quite a lot of time. So typically the program would run overnight on a laptop computer. So here's just some sample code for the activation dynamics. So what you can see is it's a loop, right, for each time step um, from the, um, the delay in activation onset due to excitation 
contraction coupling plus one time step because we're taking the derivatives, right? We actually calculate the, um, the first order activation dynamics, which is given by the first two lines of code. And then we use um, uh, Euler's method to take the derivative of the first order activation, the first derivative of the first order activation, and then the second derivative of the um, first order activation. And so you can easily just by commenting out the activation step number two or, or both activation step one and two, you can change the order of uh, the model. Um, really easily. And so the output of this part of the code then is the activation of the muscle as a function of time. And so the second part then um, of the model is the muscle mechanics code. Um, and so again, you have um, for um, I equals one to the number of um, data points in the time points in the simulation, you um, uh, input the muscle length and velocity data, and you use simple equations uh, and do the free parameter or the, the fixed parameters are shown here, right? So three parameters for the active force length relationship, two parameters for the passive force length relationship. And then um, you uh, calculate the velocity from the length data and then, um, uh, run a loop to estimate the debit of force or increase of force um, due to the force velocity relationship. So if the muscle is shortening, the force will be less. And if the muscle length is staying the same or increasing, then the force will be more. And then you end by calculating the muscle force and multiplying by the pination angle. And just as Sarabi did in the Crossbridge models, you'd simply add the passive muscle force. So hopefully I didn't go through that too fast. <laughs> um, so, um, so now I want to just talk a little bit about, so if we have like eight free parameters in our um, third order muscle activation, how can we optimize those parameters to get the best fit to data since we um, can sometimes measure the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the activation and deactivation time constants for, from experiments for the first order models, but not for the higher order models typically. So, um, so parameter optimization, as I said, is similar, you know, regardless of the model that you're using pretty much. And you start by defining an objective function to minimize. And typically this is gonna be the, the objective function that we wanna minimize is gonna be a goodness of fit between the, the uh, model predicted force and the observed force in the data. And you can really use any um, criterion of goodness of fit. You can use R squared or RMSE or some other criterion, but mostly we use RMSE because it contains more information about the, um, about the difference between the model and the data than simply the R squared because it it's looking at not just the pattern of change in the force, but actually the average force over the whole simulation. Um, the second step is to define the number of free parameters to be optimized. So in the case of the Hill model, it would be eight. And we also have to select the upper and lower bounds for each parameter that are going to be um, included in the optimization. Um, and this can be done in a, any number of ways, but for example, we could simply say, okay, um, we're gonna multiply, I think in my example, we're gonna look at 150% above and below the, um, um, the, uh, the, whatever the initial value of the parameter is in, in our optimization. So just quickly to talk about local versus global optimization, um, any of you who've run simulations know that you can literally <laughs> run an optimization that will never stop. Like it, the, your whole life, the simulation will go on. So, so we, we, um, if, we, if we have um, big enough bounds and a large enough number of free parameters, then these optimizations can run for your lifetime or for infinity. So if you have 
a few parameters, like I always say like two, so you just want to fit, sorry, the Hill equation. You can do this by hand using Excel and less time it will take you to write computer code. But when you have three or more parameters, you're going to be using some kind of um, function in some kind of program. And um, uh, FMinCon is a really commonly used optimization program which does local optimization by exhaustively searching small parameter spaces. But again, if you have a big parameter space and you, you might find a local solution, but it might not be the best solution. So when you have a big parameter space and a lot of parameters, it's better to do global optimization, which provides a non-exhaustive search of a larger parameter space. And a common one that's often used is called particle swarm in MATLAB. And particle swarm is similar to like a genetic algorithm in that you have a lot of actors or individuals and they're moving in steps through the parameter space. At each step, the um, particle swarm algorithm evaluates the objective function at each particle. And then based on the rate of change in the objective function uh, in that local neighborhood, um, the, the algorithm will decide the new velocity of each So the particles move faster through the parameter space when the um, objective function is changing faster. Um, and again, um, if you have a lot of parameters um, and wide bounds, um, this it can require like overnight or even multiple days to run the parameter optimization. So, um, oops, let's see, I guess that was right. Okay, so now let's quickly look at tight and clutch models. Um, so uh, again, this is a little bit of review from the last time. So the Titan model, the Titan clutch model has a total of 11 parameters, six of which are typically free. So we have some of the same uh, free parameters as in the Hill model. So our um, delay due to excitation contraction coupling and an activation factor that scales the relationship between activation and force, the maximum isometric force, optimal length, these are very similar to the Hill model. Um, but in our Titan inspired model, we have a pulley. And the, the pulley very broadly is thought to represent the actin filaments in muscle. But basically, you know, in a very abstract level, what it does is it allows the um, strain in the Titan spring to be independent of the change in muscle length. As a consequence, the the velocity of the contractile element, which also turns out to be an important model component, is also depends on the pulley translation. And really, one clever feature is that the when the when there's no change in length, so during an isometric contraction, the contractile element and the tightened spring are in parallel. So as the contractile element shortens, it ex it, it extends the tightened spring. And that can help to explain force enhancement and force depression, and in general, the history dependence of force. So one other quick difference being that we also have a muscle mass as a parameter in our um, Titan-inspired model. And one difference being that we have two damping constants and two uh, uh, spring stiffnesses that are free parameters that are relatively difficult to measure experimentally. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So how does the algorithm work? So first we define the model parameters and the input variables, uh, time, activation, and length. Then we calculate the force of the contractile component, which looks very similar to the force of the contractile component in Hill models. Then we have steps that calculate the pulley. So it's a basically a kinematic model that calculates the pulley rotational acceleration velocity and position and the pulley linear acceleration velocity and position. And from that, we calculate the muscle force um, because the, the, the force of the contractile element and the force of Titan both depend on the um, pulley position um, as I discussed previously and as you'll be able to see hopefully in the code when we look at it in a minute. 
And, um, and because we're um, uh, uh, not doing multiple um, uh, uh, ODEs, um, but simply one, this code also runs in minutes. So I actually, you know, it would be possible to run the code within the workshop, but I elected not to for simplicity. So here's our Titan inspired model code. And again, the blue is where the um, parameters come in. And the red is the um, activation and length inputs and the output very similar to the hill model is the muscle force in each time step times the pination angle of the muscle. And so what you can see is first we calculate what the force of the contractile element is. Um, then we um, calculate the acceleration, velocity, and position of the pulley in the linear um, uh, translation the acceleration, velocity, and position of the pulley in the angular <clears throat> um, translation, and then we have um, our angular rotation. And then we have these three, pos well, one position and two velocities that are calculated based on the pulley position. So XTS is the displacement of the Titan spring, X dot TS is the velocity of the Titan, or, so XTS, so this is used to calculate FTS by multiplying by the um, Titan stiffness. Um, X dot TS, the velocity of the Titan spring is used to calculate the damping on the Titan spring. And then the X dot CE, which is the velocity of the contractile element is used to calculate the damping in, of the contractile element. So one difference is instead of a force velocity relationship, we have linear damping on the um, contractile element in this model. So let's quickly look at the force predictions of the models and talk about some of their assumptions and limitations. Um, so this is, again, data that I showed you last time. So these data are from um, Monica and Janica's um, guinea fowl running on a treadmill. Um, these are, or walking actually in this case. So the guinea fowl walking on a treadmill, uh, it's a relatively slow walking speed. There's no obstacles present. And so we have the length input from sonomicrometry and the activation input uh, from EMG. And um, I'm showing you here the Butterworth filtered um, data. There was standard filtering technique, um, but we also have used a wavelet filtering and it turns out that it affects the parameters a little bit, parameter values a little bit, but it doesn't affect the overall squared which way you filter the data. And here, oh, the, and here, so this is the force predictions of the hill models on top here. So the blue line is the measured force from a tendon buckle on the lateral gastrocnemius muscle. And the red dotted line is the predicted um, force from the hill model. So the basic assumptions of the hill model are that the muscle is a motor that produces force in proportion to activation governed by the activation dynamics. And then that force is modified by the um, uh, muscle mechanical properties, the active and passive force length relationship and the force velocity relationship. And so some of the limitations are that, the, and I should say that these lateral gastric nemius muscles of guinea fowl are shortening really fast and really a lot. So the muscle is like stretched and then shortens by like 20% of its rest length. Um, and so the velocities that are achieved are, you know, in excess of Vmax for a um, uh, slow fiber and, and close to um, Vmax or even for a fast fiber. So very high velocities. Um, so, um, so, so for to model these data requires filtering of the um, velocity input. Um, also, you know, as I noted last time, the reason why the passive force when the muscle is inactive is relatively poorly predicted by the hill model appears to be the fact that there's a big comp viscous component of the passive force that's not included in the passive force velocity relationship. Um, 
<clears throat> there's a relatively poor prediction. You can see the force rise is predicted well, but the force decay isn't predicted so well by the model. And that seems to be because the be because the force is debited too much by the isotonic force velocity relationship, remembering that um, the in vivo locomotion is not isotonic. So, um, so, so the, the a strength of the model is that it uses well-characterized features of muscle mechanics, but a weakness is that these features don't seem to be really informative for what's happening in vivo in terms of muscle force generation. Um, and in part, I think that's because the models fail to capture the history dependence, so the force enhancement and force depression. Um, and also the length and velocity dependence of the activation dynamics. So here's a similar um, slide showing results modeling the same data, but now using the Titan-based model. And, um, and the Titan-based model is really based on a completely different set of assumptions that the um, uh, muscle is a material that resists deformation and that activation of the muscle changes that resistance to being deformed. In our model, we assume that the, that the spring constants and the damping constants are all linear and constant. There's no activation dependence of them per se. So in the model, the pulley rotation um, uh, enables the activation to change the material properties of the Titan spring by changing its equilibrium position only. So some of the limitations of this model is that um, it's difficult to estimate the parameters from standard experiments and these, you know, the, the stiffnesses and damping parameters aren't well characterized across muscles. Um, the model does heuristic, heur, heuristically <laughs> capture, you know, the active material properties of muscle, but it, this is really like, you know, what I want to really emphasize here, this is like a conceptual first start to be modeling in this direction and by no means like the end. And people like Madhu Venkatesan and many other people are really trying to come up with better uh, models, uh, better characterization of the um, viscoelastic behavior of muscles and the effective activation on that. Um, so, um, so I think like, you know, this is the early days for this type of modeling. So what's the bottom line when we look at these different models? Um, you know, why do we use muscle models in the first place? I think there's two fundamentally different reasons. One is like practical. We want to predict muscle forces during movement. We want to use predictions for personalized medicine or enhancing sport performance, getting, Kipchoge's to time, you know, 30 seconds faster and under that two hour limit. Um, but as scientists, we also want to use models to represent our understanding of fundamental processes across multiple scales. So um, it seems like muscle as motor versus active material that there might be some, um, um, some gains in terms of it um, explaining history dependent properties and moving towards the muscle as active material uh, paradigm. But um, we could do that either by modifying Hill models or by modifying Titan base models. And the real point is here that we, in order to make accurate force predictions and to represent our understanding of uh, some of the more complex but important muscle properties, we need better models, <laughs> right? And so um, improving these models, I think is something that we're all dedicated to doing going forward. So, um, so if you'd like to try my example codes and data, you know, this is a link to a Google Drive and the link should work for anybody who has it. Um, but if you um, have any difficulty um, linking to the codes and data, or if you need help once you get there, which you almost certainly will, please feel free to email me and um, 
uh, once again, thanks to all the funders and people who really did the work, as Sarabi said. So that's my um, story, and I'm going to stop sharing and pass the baton to Taylor. Hopefully you can all see my slides, okay? Wow, those are big shoes to follow in. Um, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I guess it's morning on my side of the world. And I just, and just need to mention one thing I love about these workshops is how much I get to learn um, from my my colleagues, Sarabi and, and Kisa and Yannick, and I've really enjoyed that that process of this. So the cogs in my, my brain are turning in different ways and how I can, can use their models rather than the model I'm going to show you um, in, in the future in the future. But for this part of the workshop, I'll cover some hands on approaches for using hill type models to predict forces um, using data we've collected um, in in vivo human experiments. So this follows up from some of the experimental slides that I presented in, in our first workshop. So if you're joining for the second one, and some of it seems a little bit um, out of scope, have a have a look at the pre recorded um, version of our, our first workshop as well. All right, so here's an, an overview of what I hope to cover today. So first I'll go through a little bit model formulation and, and cover the parameters that comprise a traditional hill type model. Um, I won't go over this in too much detail because I know that, um, you know, Keith has covered it a little bit and we discussed it a couple of weeks ago. So I'll share some code that integrates force length relationship with the force velocity relationship and muscle tendon unit parameters to, to estimate forces. Uh, next, my plan will is to show you how you can do this using a GUI, so a graphical user interface where you don't need to know how to, how to code. Um, and, and you can use this to predict forces and, and conduct rapid sen sensitivity analysis to determine um, how model performance is influenced by the, the different parameters. Um, and then finally, and, and perhaps something a little bit different with a different flavor, um, is I'll provide some examples for how you can use this in these tools and teaching. For example, I've used um, this within my, my courses at UQ at the undergrad level, and I'm really passionate about um, implementing some research-led approaches for our, our undergrads to get them excited by, by research and science and maybe come do PhDs in our lab. So if you're professors or if you're grad students who are, who are tutors, um, I hope this will be useful for you. So, and, and similar to, to Kisa and Sarabi, I'm more than happy to share any code or, or the GUI. So just um, send, send me an email and I'll share the, the Google link with you um, as well. Okay, so just a, a recap and hopefully we're all on, on board with this now, but in a hill type model, muscle force depends on the magnitude and timing of muscle activity, as well as the kinematic state of the muscle, so the length, um, as well as the velocity that the, the contracting fibers are operating at and some features of architecture and, and physiological properties of the muscle. So more specifically, um, muscle force is, is a product of activation, the force length um, and the force velocity properties. You then add in the passive force length properties and then scale these based on um, the, the maximum um, isometric force and um, in pennate muscles, the, the um, angle that the fibers lie relative to the um, um, the, the line of action. Okay, so let's first cover how the model is, is formulated and some of the equations and parameters that underpin these, these force predictions. Um, I'll run through the code, um, but first I've just copied out some of the key lines to cover in my slides, similar to Sarabi um, ha has done, because I think it's always a little bit nervous running code in these live, live workshops, but we'll do that together um, after. Okay, so first the force length relationship. So this is comprised of, a, of an active and a passive curve. And within both equations, um, fascicle length or fiber length is normalized to what we call fascicle slack length or, or, or which is essentially optimal, optimal fiber length. Um, this is defined here as resting length. And it's one of the most challenging parameters to, to measure in, in vivo and in humans. Um, and your model is quite sensitive to this, this value. Uh, the shape of the active force length curve is then governed or defined by three parameters, which are the skewness, the width, and the roundness. And the values um, in, in this particular model are based on Sabrina Lee's 2013 paper, which uses experimental data from, um, um, from goats, essentially. Um, and then the passive force length curve is similar to that provided by Matt Millard and colleagues in their 2013 paper, and it's 
based on a combination of, of experimental data from, I think it's chemically skinned human gastrocnemius fibers and, and rabbit hole muscles. So it's a, an exponential function um, with a constant that, that scales the, the slope, for example. So the passive properties are, are more stiff or, or less stiff. Next um, is the force velocity relationship where, where velocity is, is in this case fascicle velocity and I say fascicle velocity because in, in human experiments um, we, we measure using B-mode ultrasound the behavior of fascicles and not the behavior of, of muscle fibers. Um, so this is normalized to, to again um, resting or nominal length um, which, which again is our optimal fiber lengths. The units become lengths per, per second which is equivalent to, to strain rates. Then we have a parameter called alpha, which describes the, the curvature um, of the, the force velocity relationship. And this depends um, primarily on, on fiber type. So the values used in, in this are taken from a, from a lit review of about 30 different species done by Emma Hudson Toll in, in her PhD. And what this equation says, if, if strain rate is, is greater than zero, zero, then the shape of the curve um, looks like this. And if um, otherwise, so if it's, it's less than zero, that the shape of the strain rate or the shape, the shape of the curve looks like this. And this is essentially um, Hill, Hill's equation, um, Hill's force velocity equation. Um, so the two, you have two equations which describe the, the concentric and the eccentric regions of the force length curve. And then the two free parameters that you have to play with are the curvature and the maximum intrinsic speed or the, or the V max of the muscle, which, which both vary with fiber types, not just curvature, but also um, V max. Okay, so that's a bit of a, a taster for the model formulation and parameters. And I understand I'm going through this quite quickly, but I'm um, more than happy to, to follow up if anyone has um, further questions or wants me to run them through you know, at a bit um, slower of, of pace. Um, so here's what the, the curves look like when you, when you plot them. And, and we can use these relationships together with, with some time varying data. And this is an example um, for, for cycling or pedaling. So here's one pedal cycle. You can go see that crank angle goes from zero to 360 degrees. So one, one revolution. And the model inputs um, include normalized activation. So the value between zero and, and 1.0, 1, 1 1.0 being a, a maximally active muscle, all of the motor units within that muscle um, are, are active. Um, so it relies on, on um, normalizing your EMG data, which um, is, is challenging for dynamic tasks. Um, then we have the force length um, or the, the FASCA length, which again is normalized. So at 1.0, 1 it would mean that the muscles at um, optimal FASCA length or resting FASCA length. Um, we have the force velocity um, or the, the velocity of the fascicle, which again is, is normalized um, to, to optimal fascicle length and negative velocities indicate the muscle shortening. And then finally, we have panation angle, which essentially scales the, the, um, the fiber force, depending on the angle of the fibers relative to the muscle's line of action. Um, okay, so now let's run this together in, in some code to predict some forces. And I'll just um, switch here. And, and I am a little bit of the black sheep and that majority of my coding is done in, in Mathematica um, and not in, in MATLAB, um, but it's much of the, the same. Okay, so here we have these um, same equations I just showed you, the force velocity relationship, the active force length relationship, and the passive force, force length relationship. So let's just plot um, these curves. Beautiful. So we have muscle fiber um, force length relationship. Here I've just plotted it between 0.5 and, and 1.8 um, of normalized lengths. And here you can see the, the force velocity relationship. Now I want to set up some, some model inputs um, to, to, to this model. So I've um, this is this, the same cycling data that I was just um, referring to. So we'll, we'll load it. We'll define the parameters in here. So we have the activation, the fascicle length, the panation angle. Um, this is two muscles, the medial gastrocnemius and the lateral gastrocnemius. I'll just predict forces for, for one of the muscles for now. Then we've de defined our optimal um, fascicle length, the Vmax, the force velocity curvature, as well as the maximum isometric force of that muscle. So the units of ma maximum isometric force are in newtons, um, uh, the curvature is unitless, Vmax is in um, lengths per second, 
and optimal fiber length in this case is in, is in meters. Okay, so now we'll just, um, from our length data, um, also compute the velocity, and now we can see these same curves. So we have activation, length, velocity, and fination angle. And then what we can do is just run the model, and it's really um, one, one line of code. This is the, the line of code here, where um, muscle force is a product of um, the, the activation, the active force length properties, and the, the force velocity properties. We add on the, the passive force length properties. And then this is scaled via maximum isometric force um, and the, the cosine of panation angle. So I'll just run this line of code. And here we can see these are our predicted forces, the y-axis being Newtons. And I've just separated here these into the active and the passive forces. So you can see the independent contributions um, of each. So I know I went through that quite, quite quickly, but again, happy to, to share this, um, this code at any time. So now I'm just going to flick back to my slides. Okay. So for the next part of, um, I can share this, brilliant. All right, so um, the next part of my component of the workshop, I'm gonna show you how you can start to play with the model parameters um, and with different bits or, or sets of input experimental data pr to predict forces or to run sensitivity analysis to determine which parameters um, your force predictions are most sensitive to this. Um, and I'll use a, a graphical user interface where the equations I just showed you are, are lying under the hood. So we won't look at those again. And it instead allows you a, a friendly interface to play around um, with the model. So again, I'll just um, switch programs here quickly. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so here is the, the GUI. Um, and I'll just quickly tell you um, that this GUI was supported by um, a grant for, for teaching and research um, through the university. So I worked together with um, Professor Francois Hoog, who's, who's in France, and a colleague of mine, Kylie, T Associate Professor Kylie Tucker, and we worked for the computer scientists to, to um, help create this and make it very user friendly for those who, who, don't, um, who don't code. So you can load in different sets of experimental data, and I'll come back to this. Um, and here's the configuration of, of the model. So it allows you via either typing in numbers to the boxes or using the slider bars to modify the different model parameters. So I'll just quickly walk through them. So we have optimal fascicle length here. We have maximum isometric force in, in Newtons. We can also um, subdivide this into the PCSA of the muscle and, and the maximum isometric stress or, or specific tension of the muscle. Um, you know, you can you can have a play around with these, and if you make the the graphs do all sorts of strange things, you can always um, restore your, your defaults back to the um, parameters that I just showcased in the in the Mathematica code, and then we can play around with the shape of the force length curve via these these um, three parameters: so skewness, width, and roundness. And you can see if I change the, the skewness, that the shape of that curve changes. If I increase the width, you essentially elongate the 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 plateau um, and then you can play around with the, the curvature so the the shape of the ascending and the, and the descending limb um, of the, the force length curve as well and then we have a scalar for passive stiffness you can make the muscle um, more stiff or you can make the muscle less stiff and then we have the two um, free parameters for the force velocity curve so we have um, the curvature you can see here changes the the shape of the force velocity curve making it um, essentially flatter and, and more curved. And then we have the maximum intrinsic speed, which um, is a little bit hard to see, but you can see the, the y-axis of the velocity, um, or, or sorry, the x-axis units are, are changing in this case. So I'll just restore the defaults for these. So this is the same um, cycling data I just showed you, but we've also done some work on, on walking data. So what I'll do is I'll actually show you how we can load in some experimental data. So this is um, some, some walking data, so a spreadsheet of the normalized activations, lengths, um, and, and panation angle. And then you can just select the data that you, that you want to um, uh, uh, run within your model. And this is essentially going to be just the column headers from um, the file that you just loaded. So I'm going to um, predict forces in the medial gastrocnemius. So my activation is, is from my EMG data. I have my 
um, medial gastrocnemius fascia length, and I have my medial gastrocnemius pination angle. Now you have, um, you know, time normalization and how we deal with our data is, um, is always uh, a bit of a, um, uh, a challenge. So we've allowed in this GUI for you to define the time or, or of your data set in different ways. So I know, for example, the total length of, of this data set, it's, it's one, one gate cycle is, I've got it written in front of me, 0 0.89 seconds, 0 0.89 seconds. Um, and this is data um, uh, re that we recently published um, in, a, in a journal of experimental biology paper um, with my PhD student, Raphael Hemard. So a big thank you to him for, for getting this um, going. So if we click out, I can now load this data. And here you can see now this is walking, muscle activation, um, the fascial length change. We know that, for example, during the, the stance phase, the fascial is relatively isometric. We have the velocity data, which you can see in this case hasn't been, been filtered. And I know Kisa mentioned this a couple of times, um, that, that the model is sensitive to noisy force velocity data, so that it typically does need to be filtered um, uh, again or, or smoothed in some way. And here we have panation angle. So then I can um, just copy this data to my model. It will give me um, a warning. Are you sure you, you want to? Yes, I do want to. And now this data has been copied um, to my model and it's what you'll find um, within your, your model configuration um, file. So, and then we can similarly play around with the parameters. Um, the other thing I wanna quickly show you is if, for example, I want to run a sensitivity analysis for how optimal fascial length influences predicted force during, this is level walking. Um, here I can see my predicted forces down here um, in, in this particular plot. So I want to run, let's say, three different models where I vary optimal fiber length, so or fascial length. So here's model one. I'll save my current model. This uses my, my best guess. Then I'm going to increase it by four millimeters. I'm going to run a second model. Here I'm going to save that second model. And I'm going to run it one more time, again, increasing um, my optimal fascial length by another four millimeters, and I can save this as model three. And then I can go through here to my save models, and I can see my different force predictions by varying optimal um, fascial length in this particular case. Um, I can see what the shape of the force length and force velocity curves that underpin these different parameter shifts are. Um, and then I can export, for example, the data into, into a nice um, spreadsheet that, that we can use in, in further analysis. So hopefully that um, is a little bit of a taste of how you can use um, this, this hill type model in a, in a nice format and you don't need to um, have, um, you know, a background in, in, in um, computational biomechanics or anything like that. Okay, so now I'll just flick back to my, my PowerPoint. I've gone through a demonstration with the GUI. And then the final thing I wanted to, to cover, um, hopefully we've got a couple minutes, is some applications for how you can use hill type models in, in your teaching. Now, I've had some, some good success. It's taken a few years to get, get going and I'm very happy to share the teaching materials with um, professors or grad students. Um, and, and part of the inspiration for creating this GUI um, was what when I tried to run this in, in a practical or a tutorial, um, I spent my entire time troubleshooting how to get MATLAB or Mathematica running on my students' computers. So we really needed um, a solution. My students typically come from physiotherapy or human movement sciences um, backgrounds or biomedical sciences, but they don't have um, strong skills in, in um, coding in, in any language. So that was the inspiration for creating this GUI, and, and, and I've used it um, within now a variety of, of different courses. So it, it is working. Um, it can always be improved, of course. So I'll just run through a couple different case studies or how we've used it. So first is um, one thing we've done is looked at um, um, case studies is cerebral palsy. So I, I typically will give a little bit of background information to the students. So here highlighting that CP is associated with increases in passive muscle stiffness um, due to contractures. And then I ask them, for example, in this case, to imagine they're an orthopedic surgeon. My biomed science students love this because they all want to go to med school, um, who is deciding whether they should operate on a, on a 12 year old patient with, with CP. Um, and then, so I've asked them to determine how these increased passive stiffness 
this influence um, force production during walking. And I won't spend a, a long time on these. I'll sort of flick through them um, pretty quickly. But the, the basic thing is here, what I want them to do is, is um, acknowledge that you can change that with passive or with CP, that the passive muscle properties and, and um, pro probably the, the passive force length curve. Keith is probably looking at me going, it's probably up more things than this and given Titan and it's the active properties as well. But um, keep in mind, this is for, for teaching purposes and, and I'd love to improve it um, with, with anyone here who's interested in. Um, and you can see there's a, there, there's a change in the forces. So all the model parameters between the healthy shown in um, this, this pink purple color and the CP patient, um, or I should say typically developing, um, and the CP patient um, are similar. And the only parameter that changes by a factor of, of two is the passive stiffness. So that's one example. The other example um, or case study that we do is about aging and muscle quality. So for example, we've done some work um, to show that in, in healthy older adults, the size of a muscle, so the volume often doesn't change, but the amount of fat within the muscle does. So this is a younger um, adult and this is an older, so over 65 years of age. And you can see that the size of the muscle doesn't vary markedly, but the amount of, of fatty infiltration increases. So in this particular scenario or case study, we've asked them to, to to, to determine what a 20% increase in intramuscular fat would have on, on the specific tension and, and, and the muscle um, uh, force output. And in doing this, they could do something similar. So they have, um, sorry, this should be young and, and older. So young shown in, in, in red and older shown in purple. And again, um, you can see here that the, the PCSA, so the size of the muscle doesn't change but the specific tension or the maximum isometric stress decreases, which leads to an overall reduction in maximum isometric force. And you can see that then forces, for example, during walking would be lower and, and the shape of the force length and force velocity curves um, would be altered. And then um, the final one I'll quickly just discuss is a lot of my students are, in, are exercise science and they're interested in, in performance and strength training and exercise interventions. Um, so I give an example of there's, there's uh, this field is a little bit contentious, but contentious, but there's a study that found it at 12 weeks of sprint training increases um, uh, essentially type two, type two fibers. So the, the idea here is I wanted them to, un to understand which um, parameters in the hill type model would be would you would vary if you change the type of fibers that you have um, within within a muscle. And um, so then in this particular case, um, here we have the model before training, which you see in orange, but you can barely see because the, the turquoise model or the change in, in maximum intrinsic speed or Vmax lies basically directly over top it. Um, and then we have a model where the, the stress um, or the the um, specific tension increases. So you can see, for example, here, which parameter has the largest influence on force production. In this case, it's the increase in, in maximum isometric stress, but the changes in Vmax, for example, related to a 20% um, a change in, in fiber type um, have, a, have a relatively minor influence on force predictions. So that's all I have um, for today. I hope we still have some time for, for questions, but I really need to acknowledge um, my wonderful colleagues who helped um, get this all together and inspired some of the ideas um, within. And as I said, I'm, I'm really happy to, to share um, code or that GUI if you think it would be useful in teaching or talk about ways to, to improve it. All right, and hopefully we have some time for questions and discussion. Is that right, Yannicka? Yes, so now we have time for questions. Um, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, I already got some questions um, from Monica. So for Surabi, has the explored questions about interactions with connective tissue compliance uh, with Crossbridge modeling framework, does it have the capacity to explore interactions at that scale? Um, uh, so I think I'm understanding the question is, does the crossbridge, can you have uh, connective tissues in the crossbridge model that contribute to the force? Is that the idea? I think so. Um, essentially, yeah, if you have explored questions about interactions with connective tissue compliance with the model framework, 
Um, so yeah, so like I showed you a single sarcomere, but that can have um, a parallel and series uh, series elements that can have compliance. And you can imagine that you can scale up multiple sarcomeres into, and then add a compliance comp like you can add a parallel or a series elastic component to that, and that would be how you model the connective tissue in the cross bridge model. Um, as far as whether it's been explored, um, yes, but I guess it depends on what particular context. And yeah, it's probably not explored in all contexts, and that's something we want to do. Yeah. Also got a follow up question for you. Um, do you have any closing thoughts on best practices for systematically designing read functions? Um, so I think that was one of my slides, which is just to say, um, we like, we want to come up with how we uh, ideas of how we want the rate function to look like based on what aspects of force we want to try and model. But uh, so that's how I would go about it. I I create different types of rate functions based on whether I want the cross bridges to be attaching or detaching and producing force at different uh, based on different lengths and activations. But then I go back and make sure that these uh, rate functions are within physiological reason. And then, yeah, that's essentially how I would do it. And also, yeah, keep in mind that the rate functions will be different for different types of muscle fibers. So you also want to make sure you're constraining it appro appropriately. Are any questions from the audience? Also got a question from Monica for Taylor. Any advice on best practices for normalizing experimental data to effectively use in the modeling framework? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so it depends on which which data um, uh, <laughs> is in question, I guess. Um, so so for EMG. Um, normalizing like if in the context of, of a modeling specific study and in a, in a set of muscles or some key muscles I would always try to collect some really good um, maximum voluntary contraction data from from isometric tasks in a dynamometer or something like that um, for normalizing the EMG data now this is challenging if you have multiple muscles or for example a clinical population if you have a clinical population I, I do think you need to use um, you know, twitch interpolation and probably um, externally activate to ensure that you're getting um, all of the motor units active within a muscle. Um, normalizing force length and force velocity too, it's like one of the most challenging um, aspects of, of using this data from, from um, ultrasound experiments. And, and we've done some work um, looking at for example, if you combine shear AV elastography to determine, you know, fascicle slack length, which is at a different um, length, muscle tendon unit length and tendon slack length, um, does that work? Um, if you, you know, do subject specific force length curves, which is very, very time consuming and often not possible. If, for example, in these experiments, you're having someone come in for an MRI and come in to do, you know, some um, isometric forces and come in to do some walking or cycling data um, or, or experiments. Um, and, and what we've we've often had to do is determine the fascial length um, at, for example, ground contact when forces um, rise during walking, or um, we had the tendon buckle data from Bob Greger's cycling paper that we sort of mapped onto our data to determine where that value lied to normalize um, the ultrasound data, but it's certainly one of the, the more challenging aspects. And I think um, we have lots of work to do in that space still. Thank you. Anybody else who has a question? Also a great moment to remind everybody that this session is recorded. Um, and as um, most of us said during this session, if anybody wants to play around with the code or has questions, follow-up questions past this session, feel free to reach out. Can I ask a question? Of course. 
Okay, I've got a question for, for Kisa. Um, Kisa, one of the like the big challenges in, in using these types of models in humans is, is we often don't have a gold standard to evaluate them them against. And, and you know, in the past we've used tendon length changes combined with, with tendon stiffness values to try and get an estimate of muscle force and, and use that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether, you know, it'd be nice to determine whether you can just use inverse dynamics approaches and in, in, for example, in the tricep surrey and back calculate out, out forces. But one of the, the challenges in doing that is we don't have any information from swing phase then because, you know, there's no force plate data. Um, so, so I guess my question is, um, do you think that we should care about swing phase. Um, you know, uh, can we use inverse dynamics to evaluate these models? Oh, you're just on mute. It's a difficult question. I mean, that's the, I think that, you know, of all the in vivo data, the, you know, there's obviously issues with the EMG data too, but the, the in vivo force data are typically, you know, the rarest in the literature to find and the most fraught with with problems. Um, so I think I think a good approach is to, you know, use what data is there, like do the best you can with the inverse dynamics, and then try different muscle models and see whether the result that you get makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I think. Um, one really big set of assumptions that really limits the usefulness of in vivo force data is the common tendon problem. And how do you assign forces to, um, to different muscles? And, you know, just based on activation or, um, you know, PCSA or some combination of that. And so I think it could be really interesting to try different muscle modeling approaches to see whether they all give similar solutions, you know, to the problem of, you know, assigning force to different muscles or not. Okay, cool, thank you. Well, and if there are no questions anymore, uh, for our panel of today, then I am going to um, end the recording and I'm going to one more thank our whole panel. Thanks, ladies, for this awesome second workshop. Um, and I hope to see the audience with the other workshops um, in the upcoming weeks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah.